Well, I am pleased to be joined by one of my favorite all-time Major League Baseball players, Glendon Rush. And that's not to get your your head swelled or anything, but, you know, it was so fun to deal with you and that whole group with the Cubs in, in 2004 and five. I mean, 2004 was kind of a weird year, and then well, five kind of got a little away from you guys, but uh, it was a tightly knit group, wasn't it? Great group. Uh, we, you know, still a ton of us keep uh, keep in contact to this day and keep up with each other. And and it's 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 always fun to go back and relive those memories. I mean, it's hard to believe that it's been that long. I mean, now we're talking 17 and 18 years back now, and uh, I feel like it was just the other day that I I left the game, you know, and retired, but. Man, to go back to those Cubs days, it's we're it's not going to be long. We're going to be pushing twenty years, you know, of of those teams that that I played on there. So it's crazy how quick time goes. Yeah, making me feel light and nice and old as well. Showing me, he showed me a picture before we started of his son. Who I remember walking around the clubhouse as a little little skinny runt guy, and then now now he's playing baseball. He's a senior. Yep, senior in high school. Crazy. Yeah, he was rolling around uh, at Wrigley as a as a little dude. Oh, that makes me feel so old. But, it, you know, it does harken back to some good days. I mean, that team, uh, especially in 04, think about some of the guys that were on that ball club. I mean, Greg Maddox, of course, was uh, – was he'd come back to Chicago, and uh, that was uh, something that a lot of the fans were clamoring for. You got to, you got to play with some pretty influential guys. I did. I, I was lucky. You know, I had, um, I had Mike Maddox, Greg's brother, as my pitching coach in Milwaukee. So I kind of got to know – a little bit about Greg behind the scenes through his brother. And then, and then of course, uh, you know, joined the, the Cubs in 04 with Greg. We had Matt Clement, uh, Big Z, Pryor, and Wood. So, I mean, what a rotation. And for me to, you know, I always joke around and call myself the uh, debt left shrimp of the of that rotation, the sixth man. I was kind of a fill-in guy and got, got some opportunities to start when injuries came up. So it was, it was pretty special to be a part of that. It really was. And then on the position player side, I mean, what an incredible – lineup we had with D Lee and Rami and, and, uh, you know, later in the year got, uh, started out with Alex Gonzalez later in the year, got, um, Nomar, you know, Todd Walker. I mean, we had a, and then of course, of course, Moises CP, Corey Patterson and, uh, and Sammy in the outfield. So, I mean, we were a, we were a potent loaded lineup. And one of my biggest regrets is looking back on that season that we weren't, we didn't make the playoffs, you know, we were right there to the end and, and down to that last week of the season and weren't able to make it in. Yeah, you know, not to make excuses, but I tell people this all the time because, you know, I was traveling with you guys at that point, and the the hurricane didn't do you guys any favors that year because that whole series got wiped out in Florida. One of the games at Wrigley Field that you played the Marlins as a, as a doubleheader, you guys had to be the visiting team at home, and then we had to make that game up in between a three-city uh, road trip that lasted like 10 days. Yeah, I think the guys went to uh, – I think I pitched in uh, Cincinnati – and then uh, Kerry Wood and I flew to Pittsburgh because we were going to Pittsburgh next. He was the next starting pitcher, and I had just pitched, so I was going to be useless in, in Miami. And then they had to go down for 24 hours or whatever, play one game. Yeah, it was a rough schedule at the end. Um, you know, the series that killed us was the, you know, the Reds and the Braves at the end, and, and, and we weren't able to put it together. Yeah, I remember being at Chase Stadium, too. That Mets series was uh, was tough, especially – was it Craig Breslow that hit the home run? Victor Diaz hit the home run to, to win that game. And that kind of sent it down uh, in a little spiral as well. Yeah, that was rough. That There were so many things that you go back on. And, and I know every baseball season's like that. But, man, what a frustrating season, especially what those guys did the year before. And, and uh, you know, we're so close to being a World Series team and and the talent that we had. It's not, it's not like we were overachieving. If anything, we underachieved a little bit uh, down the stretch. Could you sense that uh, all the pressure on that team, though, especially what, like you mentioned, what they had come off of in 03 and then being in the thick of things, I mean, all the way to the end in 04, it seemed to me, and I've been around that club for a, a few years before you got there and I've been a fan my entire life, sensing a, there, there was kind of a difference in the crowd and the expectations of those crowds as well. I think there was a difference in the crowds, um, you know, just speaking off of opinion, but I obviously wasn't there in 03, but, but, but there were, I didn't feel there was any difference in the clubhouse. I felt like us in the clubhouse that we walked into that season. Um, I, I joined them a few weeks in, but I felt like those guys walked into that season ready to, to be a playoff team again and, and expected it. Yeah. I mean, I, I know that uh, a lot of the media members expected that as well. And uh, you know, unfortunately things didn't work out the way that they, uh, they should have, but you know, you fast forward 12 years and I, I, do you still feel a part of all that? Because you know, the Cubs won the World Series in 2016. I know that uh, Woody was around a lot and 
Uh, a lot of the guys from uh, from the past, including Demp, uh, were were around. Were you around for any of those games? Uh, I was. I was there for. So I watched all three of the um, NLCS games in LA, and then I came out to Wrigley and watched uh, games three, four, and five. Uh, I wasn't able to make the trip to Cleveland, unfortunately. I would have. I would have probably got kicked out of the house by then. I'd <laughs> seen enough playoff baseball, but yeah, I got. I got to see him and be a part of it. And absolutely, I think every guy looking back when when we go through as as former players as a Cub, um, we all felt a part of that. We all felt some sort of tie into the to the organization and the fan base and everything had been so long. And and um, so it was really cool to see. And I and I was glad to be there and be a part of some of it. Where were you when they finally clinched it? I was at home on my couch watching, uh, you know, watching from there. Uh, and um, and then, you know, the following year got to come back for the convention, uh, which was really cool. You know, I get I get back to those as, as often as I can. And the guys are always really nice and invite me back. And um, that was fun. It was fun to see that fan base really get rewarded for a lot of years of, you know, ups and downs and, and never winning a World Series. So I got my man Otis is talking to me right now. Oh, wow. You got a notice as well, huh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I got a little notice over here. And uh, yours was not named after your former clubhouse guy, Tom Hellman, was it? He absolutely was. Oh. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Let me see if I can move him here. Hold on. All right. No problem. Glendon Rush is joining us here on the uh, Andy Mazur podcast. My little Otis uh, is off to my left here. And he was actually named after uh, Otis Wilson of the Chicago Bears and also – my man Otis, Otis Day in the Nights from Animal House. So it's kind of a happy, happy accident that we get on our Otis Tom Hellman as well. Yes. Oh, yeah. Had to, I had to have somebody, so, something named after Tom Hellman, right? I mean, it's pretty much mandatory. That guy's a, he's a, a legend in the clubhouse. And uh, we became great buddies with that whole crew down there and uh, love those guys. I still talk to him quite often. Otis, the, the biggest Cincinnati Bengals fan I think I've ever met. Yes. And, it, you know, I should have done some better recon when I was coming on your show and sent the, the famous picture of when uh, we dressed him up as a Cincinnati Bengal on the road. I was there. I was I, I've got that on my phone somewhere. That was the, one of the greatest ever. Seeing him seeing him loading luggage with a full Cincinnati Bengals uniform on was one of the highlights of my year for sure. But the best part of that whole thing was after the plane took off and we were, we were at cruising altitude, was him getting down to the three-point stance in the aisle and running up and down the aisle. <laughs> Oh yeah, the, the, those guys looked at us like we were absolutely out of our minds because they're like, "Wait, you guys can't dress the clubbies up. You're supposed to dress the rookies up." I'm like, "Oh, you guys are getting dressed up too." Yeah. Oh, that was those are some great times. Great times. Back to the World Series here, real quick too, because I remember I had to work that night. I was doing a, a an extended post game show on the radio station, and the guy that I was working with grew up a White Sox fan. No, no offense to him or anything. He was really into it as well. He was kind of happy for uh, for me and a couple other guys. I literally, the first call I made was to my dad to make sure that what I was seeing on my TV was actually happening on his TV as well, that I wasn't dreaming what was going on <laughs> because I didn't, I, I didn't know, I, I'd never experienced it before. Yeah, no, it was, it was special. And, 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 it, you know, for it to end the way it did and come down to, you know, I mean, there was so much drama involved in, in those games all the way through. And uh, I, I think that every fan that, was a part of it in some way and, and had been a Cubs fan since they were a kid and, and uh, had parents that were Cubs fans and grandparents that were Cubs fans. I mean, it was special for everybody. And I, you know, I, I, I see that the expectations change, right. As, as soon as that happened, then all of a sudden it's like the Cubs are a perennial playoff team. We're expected to win the world series year after year after year, you know, as an organization. And, and it's been tough. And I, and I, uh, I, I've been following them, Quite a bit, obviously, uh, since I retired and, and since I stopped playing there, and I always keep up to to speed on what's going on. And I, I love what they're doing this year. I love the I love the uh, some of the younger guys, and and uh, Saya has been a great addition to the the crew. And I, I think um, you know with with uh, Rossi at the helm, I think they're going to get back to where they need to be. As busy as you are, I mean, uh, you know, dealing with uh, with two kids and uh, how many dogs is it again? Four. Four dogs, two kids. Yeah. First base coach. Uh, <laughs> I mean, what a job I have over there. Just holding everyone's gear when they show up at first. That's what I, t I tell the guys I need a shopping cart because <laughs> every kid now, you know, has uh, Evo shields on their oh, elbows yeah. and, and oven mitts they wear on their hands and everything else. So I'm pretty much I'm pretty much a clubby is what I, I tell everyone and 
they asked me what I've been doing. I said, well, I'm a clubby. I do laundry. I coach first. And yeah, so that's but, it. But you still have time to watch games. Big All the games. time. Yeah. Okay. You know, what's cool is uh, since I've been on the East coast time zone, the last five years, we moved to Louisville. So, um, I watch all the West Coast games when I lay in bed at night, which is kind of kind of cool. You know, you get the 10, 10 p.m. starts here, and I end up watching uh, whether it be the Angels, Dodgers, uh, Padres. I watch those games all the time. Mariners, my hometown Mariners. Yeah, that's where the dead left shrimp reference came from, by the way. The, yeah, the old literally. Seattle Supersonics, uh, 1996. <clears throat> Sorry. Still I know. Hard. I know. I'm a hey. I'm a I'm a Seattle fan through and through. I grew up on the you know Sonics, Seahawks, and Mariners, and um, I I pray that someday we get the Sonics back in town. I miss I miss having yeah. basketball in Seattle. They should have some ball there. I mean, now they got hockey back. Uh, they have hockey now for the first time. But yeah, uh, it'd be nice to see another basketball team out there. Absolutely. But there was one guy on that team I was actually rooting for, and that was Hersey Hawkins, who I went to to Bradley with. Oh, you did? Okay. I didn't know yeah. that back. Yeah. I didn't know that backstory. Yeah, Hersey, man. He could shoot. Not a bad little player. Yeah. For coming out of a, a nice little small college in Peoria. You know, it was uh, it was nice to see him do that. I still talk to him every once in a while, too. So I'll uh, I want to get his thoughts about that 1996 team as well. That was a good yeah, team. Yeah, please do. Tell him I'm a big fan, man. I enjoyed watching him play in Seattle. I definitely will. All right, you mentioned the Padres, because you and I were were there together for for your uh, less than full season. Uh, with the Padres, and you were coming off of your, your, you know, the blood clot, which was a scary thing. I mean, I remember seeing you in the clubhouse because you were working out and you felt something and you were smart enough to talk to the doctor. And Dr. Adams was one of those guys that was he was a jokester. But when it was something serious, he was going to he was going to give it to you straight. That was a scary thing, wasn't it? It was. Yeah, he was on top of it. I, I was in the weight room and and uh, doing my my uh, daily eye wash as a pitcher and uh Pryor came in and we were the only two guys in there and I was jogging a little bit on the treadmill and looked stark white. And he mm. said, Something, you don't look right. And uh, ended up in the training room. Dr. Adams sent me to the ER at Northwestern, which he had ran for quite a long time, like 13 right. years or something. So by the time the night was up, you know, I ended up having a pulmonary embolism and it was extremely dangerous and life threatening. And I was very lucky that we caught it in time to where it didn't shut my oxygen down. And so I missed the the rest of that few weeks of that season and then all of 2007 um, and then made a comeback. Yeah. About, I guess about 18 months later. It's an amazing story. And I, if I, if I remember this correctly, were the Cubs getting ready to travel somewhere that day or the next day? I think so. If that sound, yeah. If, if I remember correctly, I know that I was um, I was in the hospital for about a week. Okay. Um, and, and, you know, tons and tons of the guys came and visited me and brought me food and did all that cool stuff. But, um, I, I don't remember where we went on the road, but I do remember, uh, Doc Adams telling me since then I was shifted onto blood thinners. He said, if you want to sit in the dugout the rest of the season, you have to wear a helmet. And I said, absolutely not. I'll look like an idiot. So I'm not going to do that. Uh, and so I, uh, no Mar Garcia Parra gave me his, his, uh, season tickets that he had. So I sat in the stands and with the fans and watched the, the last couple weeks of that season. Hmm. Okay. So then the comeback is made and we're just past the anniversary of a crazy, crazy, crazy game that you unfortunately uh, took part in. And uh, that was the, 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 the Padres and the Rockies playing the uh, 22 inning game. And that's unfortunately how it ended. I'm showing him the video right now. You happen to be the losing pitcher on an unearned run. And then you have to go to the you have to go to the plate and you're the you're the last hope. What a what a nutty game. Yeah, I I would venture to bet that there's not too many guys who could say that they finished pitching a 22 inning game and struck out to end it. As <laughs> it doesn't doesn't happen very often. I pitched the 20th, 21st, and 22nd. Uh, I remember uh, talking to my wife that night. Kelly said she goes, I fell asleep. And I woke up and it was like 1.30 in the morning and you were pitching and she, she didn't know if it was a replay or what was going on. And I, and I remember also we were out of every, you know, obviously you get 22 innings deep into a game, you're out of every single player has been used. And Maddox was our starting pitcher the next day in Arizona. And I remember seeing him spiked up and ready to go out to the bullpen when I went out for the 22nd because we were, we were done. We were out of every single pitcher we had. He was ready to to come in and and pitch that night, and they they ended up winning the game. But that was one of the craziest experiences 
I've ever had on a baseball field. And I, t- I talk to those guys quite often still and uh, Buddy Black. And I talked to Darren Balsley quite a bit, who was our pitching coach at the time. And he says that was one of the, the coolest games he was ever a part of, even though we lost. You know, it was yeah. just it was a special bonding experience when you when you go that far into a game and everyone's, you know, pulling for each other. Every guy that's out of the game is out there. I remember at one point we had like a, a moose head or a deer head in the dugout when I came in to pitch. I mean, it was yeah, it was wild. I remember so many plays in that game that could have turned it one way or the other. And the one I keep thinking about in my mind, and I can still see it happening. Paul McAnulty hits a ball into the right field corner. And now Paul was a, was a nice guy. He was a decent ball player. He did not possess a lot of speed. And I see him running second base, heading toward third. I'm like, Oh, just stop it second. And he gets thrown out of third. That was in the 13th. I want to say. And oh wow, it was crazy. And, and you, you know, you mentioned Maddox was the pitcher the next day. We had to fly to Arizona that night. Yep. And he got pummeled in the first inning, if I remember correctly, like six runs. Yes. He gave up like six in the first and then ended up going seven innings, I think. Yeah. He told, he, from the story goes, and you maybe you can corroborate this because, you know, Buddy kind of said a little bit about it, but he said that Maddox came up to him and says, if you pull me out of this game before the seventh inning, I'm walking out of here right now. And I'm not coming back. That's that's essentially what went on. Uh, he He let them know. That just shows you what kind of a guy he is. And obviously we know he's a Hall of Famer, but man, what a teammate. Because he told Balls and and Buddy that that he was going seven innings the next day. Not to mention that Arizona is like his probably his least favorite place to pitch. Yep. Uh, if you will ask him, he'll he'll tell you that that's probably one of his, you know, maybe either 29th or 30th on the list of places that he liked to pitch. And uh he goes out and gives up six and then goes seven innings. I mean, you talk about talk about just coming through for your team because we every single one of us had gone multiple innings I think Ledesma had gone like five innings I went three so pretty much everybody was down the next day except for maybe our closer and and uh I don't know who else was left but man what what an amazing uh story to go back and and put that together because Greg Greg was a plus teammate and uh man it was awesome yeah, I can of remember his career numbers at in Arizona might have been the highest ERA of any ballpark he ever pitched, and that includes Coors Field. Agreed. And that's not easy to do with him, you know. They, he was such a uh, yeah, such he a did not like incredible it. pitcher. Yeah, did not like it there. <laughs> I don't, I don't blame him at all. Speaking of Maddox, did he have anything to do with you getting to San Diego to make that uh, that little comeback? He did. He he was a uh, part of that. He. Um, when I was throwing, uh, I was throwing at an indoor facility up in Pasadena, kind of getting prepped and getting ready to, to throw four people. Um, and when teams came, uh, Chris Quinn came and saw me, Tony's brother, and he was, you know, doing some scouting stuff for the Padres at the time. And the minute Chris saw me, saw that I was healthy, he let those guys know. And then Greg called, uh, Maddox called a uh, buddy black and let him know that, Hey, if, you know, if Glennon's healthy, you guys should take a, take a flyer on him and bring him in as a non-roster guy. And, give him an opportunity. So yeah, it was, it was huge. Um, it was cool. We had, you know, we had a kind of a little bit of a reunion there that year in spring training 08, right? We had prior trying to come back from an injury. Me, uh, Michael Barrett was there and then, and then Maddox obviously. So it was, it was pretty cool. And of course I was there too. Of course. <laughs> Always got to work myself into the story, you know, come on. Yep. Uh, those were good times. I mean, those were, I mean, I can't imagine what it was like to be a big league ball player for as long as you were, I mean, you look at 12 years in the big leagues, there's nothing to nothing to, to, to shake your finger about because I think that a lot of guys would, would love to get to two years and yet you got to 12. I was really lucky. I, I, I got to um, come up at a young age. Um, I stayed healthy and, and I got to take some licks uh, as a youngster. You know, when I was 22 and 23 in Kansas City, I got to go out there and, and put up innings and get beat up and still stay there. And and sometimes that doesn't happen depending on what organization you're in. So they gave me quite an opportunity. And then uh, when I shifted over to New York, it was then then it's kind of like, OK, you've you've got your feet on the ground. You're a big leaguer. So now you need to perform. You need to put up numbers. And and uh, I was able to do that and and then stick around, you know, lefties that, that can throw strikes and and try and stay healthy um you have a a long road ahead of you hopefully and and i was able to do that so a 17th round pick from uh from the royals back in 93 uh so you forego college and you go and you you start your your pro career at that point uh could you have ever imagined being a 17th round pick that you were going to last 12 years in the big leagues 
No, I think, you know, the, the, back then there was not enough real in-depth information and, and probably not nearly the breakdowns that there are now. And I look back on it all the time and say, what a crazy decision. You know, I signed for relatively no money, 17th round pick out of high school and go straight into the minor leagues as opposed to going to the University of Washington where I was going to go and play baseball. It The percentages are really low. And, and uh, I would not advise that for somebody in my position now. But, but also at, at that time, there wasn't a ton of information and, and, and everything else. And, and my only goal was to be a professional ball player and make it to the big leagues Yet it se- it seems so far away that that you don't really even think about it when you get in the minor leagues and and you start working your way up. You're like the big leagues looks like it's completely on the other side of the mountain. But um, I I really uh, am thankful for being in the Royals organization because man, we had a great front office staff, minor league development system, and coaches, and all the guys I had along the way were awesome. And and the players I played with too. I came up with you know Mike Sweeney and Johnny Damon and Sal Fasano and all these guys we all came up together and, and, um, and really learned how to play together and, and, uh, be, be pro ball players and respectful and responsible and take care of yourself and everything else that goes along with it. All right. So from Kansas city, you, you get to go to the Mets and, uh, there was that crazy 2000 world series, the, uh, the, the, uh, in city rivalry there between the, the Mets and the, and the Yankees. What was it like? I mean, being able to pitch in the postseason first of all, and then getting the, to go into the world series. Yeah, that was a York, whirl- no less. That was a whirlwind because I I got traded at the very end of the season in in uh, 1999. When you guys don't get traded, I got traded in September. Hmm. So I got traded after the you know the waiver deadline, and I was supposed to start the second game of a doubleheader in Kansas City. And they called me and said, "We just traded you to the Mets. Uh, they want you in Colorado tonight." And so ended up there. And what a cool experience that was because I got to watch those guys for the last three weeks of the season go down the stretch and, and eventually win the wild card, you know, the famous Al Leiter game where he threw the one hitter against the Reds and then they go in and beat the Diamondbacks and then they end up in the NLCS with the Braves. But I got to watch and learn from, uh, you know, Kenny Rogers, Al Leiter, Johnny Franco, Oral Hershiser was on that staff, all these veteran guys and, and the guys in the bullpen with Turk Wendell and Pat Mahomes senior. And those guys, took me under their wing and kind of taught me. So when I showed up to spring training in 2000, I had already kind of had a nice little prep of what it was all about and being in New York and understanding that's a completely different animal than Kansas city was. And so 2000 was awesome. I got to earn an opportunity to be in the rotation. I performed pretty well. And next thing you know, in the playoffs, I was in the bullpen and coming out of the pen and, you know, I got to, I think I pitched in six games and, in the playoffs and three out of the five games in the world series out of the pen. So it was pretty, pretty amazing experience. We opened that season in Japan. I got to go pitch in Japan. So that, that, that whole year on the baseball field was something you can't ever, you know, forget. And I look back on it and just realize how lucky I really was to get to do all that. Yeah. That 2000 season you opened against the Cubs. Yeah. We in opened. Japan, the Cubs. Yeah. yeah. And I got to pitch uh, one of the exhibition games. I got to start in Cebu against the Cebu lions and, and it, I mean, what an amazing experience that was. I want to go back to two names you just mentioned that were in the bullpen in New York. And one of them was Turk Wendell, because a lot of Cubs fans will remember this guy from coming up and being traded for and being that guy that had to have the licorice and had to turn around and wave to, wave to the center fielder, had to brush his teeth in between innings. He was a freak show. I mean, the guy he was an absolute freak show. And I think Jim Riggleman was the manager at the time and told him, said, listen, choose to either be a freak show or a major league pitcher. You know, you got to pick one. Uh, what was he like to, what was he like to be around? One of the best teammates I ever had, uh, guy would give you the shirt off his back. Um, all his antics that, that, you know, from a superstition standpoint were just part of his deal and none of it was disrespectful to anybody. It was just what he felt he had to do to succeed every day. And I, I loved it, man. I loved watching him throw the rosin bag down and <laughs> do everything that he did. And, and uh, we still keep in touch and I love Turk and, and yeah, like I said, it, I always tell this story about Turk because everyone cracks up at this one, but I called him, he was my traveling ATM because he carried around this, this great box. He was a, he was a watch collector 
And between all his appearances in New York where he'd get paid in cash and all the watches he collected, he had this really cool case. Underneath all the watches was a stack of cash, minimum of like $10,000 in there all the time, right? So anytime I'd go on a road trip, I was still a pretty young player. And I was like, Turk, can I borrow 300 bucks? And you oh, yeah, sure. And he'd open up his case. And so, yeah, he was my ATM. I always paid him back. Uh, he can confirm that. But it was pretty funny. Everyone loves that story. Oh, my gosh. Turk Wendell, the ATM. Yes, traveling ATM. Program. Nice. All right. The other name was Pat Mahomes. And uh, obviously, we know what his uh, what his boy is doing now for the for the Kansas City Chiefs. Uh, what kind of guy was 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 senior? Awesome, man. I had so much fun with some of my favorite uh, days and, and, and like going to the ballpark and everything. Uh, tons and tons of times I would ride to the ballpark with Pat Mahomes Sr. and Ricky Henderson. And to listen to those two guys and just their stories and I, man, it was it was awesome. I was so happy I got to be around those guys and Ricky was amazing and and uh, Pat Senior is awesome. What a, he was just a great mentor, and he had been around a little bit, and and uh, you know came up with the twins as a youngster with Latroy and and Tory and all those guys over there. And uh, we you know we saw little Patrick at four years old running around the clubhouse and out shagging balls. There's that famous picture of him shagging in the World Series with Mike Hampton, and when he I think he was probably about four. But so cool to see what he's done, and and uh, Pat Senior, what a great guy and great teammate. You know, you mentioned Ricky Henderson, too. And, and I've heard stories about Ricky, uh, you know, being Ricky, being Ricky is basically what he always says. And is it true? And I don't know if you know this or not, but he used to have a monogram. And it was it, instead of Ricky Henderson or RH, it said RBR. And somebody when he was with the Padres asked him, Ricky, well, your, your last name doesn't start with R. He's like, no, no, no. It's Ricky being Ricky. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I ever saw that, but that doesn't surprise me. Yeah, he was – oh, my gosh. He's so much fun. And and uh, to listen to his baseball history and stories, yeah. I mean, at that point in time when I was with him in, you know, 2000, and uh, I mean, he had he'd obviously been playing forever then. And then when you guys had him with the pods, he'd been around even longer. But what an amazing player. And uh, there's never going to be another Ricky Henderson. There will – you can play baseball as how many ever hundreds of years it's going to go on for. There will never be another leadoff hitter like Ricky Henderson. Yeah, they're, they're hands down the best of all time. You, you can't even argue it because not just the power, but the fact that if he got on, it was a double. Yep. If it was a single, it was a double. If it was a double, it was a triple because he was going to steal a base. You knew it. Yep. And they knew he was going and they still couldn't get him. Yep. He, he Gosh, he was so much fun to watch. And 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 I would love to get to see him. I got to see him in the kingdom. Um uh, when I was a kid, when he came in to play the Mariners, but I didn't really get to really appreciate what I did seeing him, you know, being his teammate, being on the bench with him. And he was one of those rare guys that threw left-handed and batted right-handed. Yeah, not very many of those. I think Randy Johnson might be one of those guys. And I yeah, think Randy was, throws left, hits right. And I was around somebody with the Padres too, uh, Ryan Ludwig. Yes, also, Ryan Ludwig. The guy, yep. a right-handed uh, hitter, but a left-handed thrower. Yep. I'm the opposite. I bat lefty and throw righty. We have a uh, we have one of those on our um, on our high school team. We have a left handed pitcher that bats right, but yeah, not not very. That's an uncommon. It's far more the other way. Yeah, and you can see what my, my how my baseball career turned out. I was in the booth before I could even you know say the word baseball. I was I was full. I'm full left. I can't do any. The only thing I can do right handed is shoot pool. I shoot pool right handed. That's right, it. What about what about golf? Do you golf lefty? I golf lefty. Okay, so I golf lefty as well. I took yeah. a lesson. Now, I want your thoughts on this. I'm, I'm totally going off the track here, but you got me thinking about it. Uh, my my fiance's parents live in Vegas, and we were out there last uh, Thanksgiving, and we got a lesson from a golf pro out there who is completely left-handed, but golf's right-handed. And yeah. he looked at me swinging the, you know, swinging the club from the left side. He's like, you should switch to right-handed. I'm like, why? Because there's, there's something about the left-handed swing. If you're, you try to overpower things, you try to hit it too hard, you try to – you know, tempo is all wrong and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, come on, give me a break. And I, you know, I, I finished the round, obviously left-handed. I came home, went to an indoor driving range and started swinging right-handed. And it's, it feels pretty natural. I can't believe it. The, see, now I could never do that. I have no skills to be able to swing anything right-handed, which is, it's amazing that you can do that. Um, my, one of my best buddies, and, and you know him very well from Chicago, Jeremy Burnett's oh, yeah. left-handed, of course, power hitter, plays golf right-handed. Beautiful, super smooth golf swing, right-handed. I don't get it. I, I could never do it. 
Yeah, but see, he was not completely left-handed, and I'm not completely left-handed either. I mean, I throw right-handed, I write right-handed. Yeah. I think he did too, if I remember. Yeah, right-handed right thrower, yep. Yeah, so I mean, I guess there's something in the brain that uh, that doesn't make it feel very foreign. Now, it's it's a, a goal of mine to be able to play around right-handed this year. That's impressive. If you do that, you got to let me know, because I there's will. no way I could do that. I wouldn't even be able to get through one hole right-handed. It was amazing. I took the, the first swing I ever took right-handed. I borrowed my, uh, my fiance's uh, seven iron. And I went out to this range, and I'm telling you, the first swing I took was like, whoa, that ball went straight. It went high, and it went pretty far. I was like, okay, I can't do that again. And yeah. I did it again. It was weird. Good tempo. Yeah. It felt like it felt natural. I don't know what the what the story was. It just felt I, like hey, I, I, I don't doubt the um I don't doubt the the teacher. I mean, I'm sure there's something to it, but definitely not in my world. No yeah. chance. Yeah, I, and I I thought he was nuts because there's no way. I'm thinking there's no way I can pick this club up right handed and, and swing it. This it's just not gonna happen. So who knows? I will I will keep you updated on that. Uh back to you, because this is a, this is about you. It's not about me. <laughs> uh you went from uh from the Cubs and uh, actually you went from Kansas city to New York, then to Milwaukee. Uh, so, you know, you, you, you've been around. I mean, at this point you're on your third organization. Uh, what, what's the thought process? Because I know you want to stick, obviously you're looking for opportunity. Did you get good opportunities there in Milwaukee? I did. Yeah, no, I, 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 uh, I failed on my second opportunity in Milwaukee. I mean, I, I, I pitched pretty well the first year we had a, we had a pretty rough team. We lost over a hundred games. Uh, but I felt like Ben Sheets and I and Jamie Wright was there with us. I felt like we kind of, you know, anchored our staff and and uh, went to the bump every five days. And I think I ended up making 34, 34, 33, 34 starts that first year. And uh, my second year, I could not do anything right. I lost confidence. I didn't believe in anything I was doing. And, and it just snowballed on me. It was all mental, really. I mean, my... My stuff was the same, and the following year I show up in Chicago, my stuff's the exact same and put some confidence behind it, and I was a different pitcher. So that part was frustrating. I loved Milwaukee, though. I got you know, I got traded there in the offseason for Burnett's and, and that, that deal that swung us. Uh, Jeff D'Amico came over uh, or went, went to New York, and um, that was hard. I, I really felt like I don't know whether it was – a combination of pressure coming into being a free agent and all that fun stuff that you go through. I don't know what got me, but definitely confidence in the mental part of it that we always talk about in baseball. It's so much of it's mental. And if you lose your confidence, you're going to, you're going to struggle. It doesn't matter what level it is. All right. Then out of the Cubs. And then of course the, the situation with the blood clot, and then you start with the Padres in 08 and you ended up uh, finishing up in Colorado. Yeah. Strangely enough, the team that uh, beat, beat you in 22 innings. Yeah, it was That's random. Uh, I, I think uh, I think Colorado was one of the teams that had quite a bit of interest coming into that, you know, when I was coming back. And for me, it was a one shot opportunity. I'd always wanted to play in San Diego at the time I was, you know, living in the L.A. area and had lived there for a long time. But if you get a chance to play in San Diego, you don't turn that down. And with the opportunity with with Buddy and, and Balsley and, and Greg being there and everything else that went along with it, it was it was impossible to turn down. And unfortunately, you know, when that decision was made, that was that uh, both of it happened to me two years in a row. That was somewhat contract based. You know, you would have that like 45 day waiver where um, if you made it past that, then, then teams were obligated to pay the rest of your salary and you were kind of stuck there. And, and if they got rid of you, they still had to pay you. And two years in a row, I got designated for assignment like 43 days into the season, right before that waiver happened. So, that was unfortunate. Um, the Padres were a class act. And and I'll never forget when those guys designated me, I went in the office, which is really rare. And everyone on that staff was in the office when they designated me for assignment, including the GM, uh, manager, pitching coach, you know, bullpen coach. Everybody was in there. And, and you could tell it was a genuine feeling of, hey, we really appreciated the way you went about your business. And um, being a veteran guy and the way you handled yourself here and everything in a short amount of time. So I felt like that was a huge compliment. And and uh, I was so bummed because I, I wanted to stay in San Diego and I loved it there. And what a great group of guys we had. And that coaching staff is awesome. It was it, that was heartbreaking to me when I had to when I had to leave there. That was one of the uh, the, the best coaching staff as a whole that I think I can remember working with. Now, I think 
the 03 Cubs coaching staff was was a close second, if not like a 1B, 1A kind of thing. But and, and you can speak better to this too because you played for him. But Buddy Black, uh, to me, was one of those managers that uh, wasn't the kind of guy that says, "Okay, I know everything. I know it all. This is the way we're going to do it. This is my show. I'm running it." He was always a guy that you know had a gut feeling, but yet got a little input and was never afraid from from our standpoint, from the media standpoint to ever be second guessed because he always had an answer for why he did something. Yeah, no, he's phenomenal. And, and, you know, you, you love it too. Cause he's got that pitching background and he's, yeah. you know, he's a pitcher at heart and great manager thinks everything through. Um, you know, one of my favorite guys on the, on the earth is Darren Balsley. I think he's one of the best pitching coaches that, you know, at the time that was in major league baseball and, and, and man, what a thinker too, with his game planning and scouting reports and everything that went along with those two guys together. And, 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 you know, same when balls did it there with Boach too. I mean, those guys were, those guys were on top of everything. They were not getting uh, outmanaged or, or, you know, no moves were being made that they weren't ready for. Um, unfortunately, San Diego just went through years and years and years where offensively they, they, couldn't put it together. Now they're doing it right now. They've got firepower. But if you look back on the way those teams pitched and their bullpens, they had, and they, and a lot of times they weren't big name bullpens either, other than, right. It was the guys leading up to Hoffy that were kind of pieced together, but man, they had some of the greatest pitching staffs and, and numbers that you would put up with PV and all those guys. And and the offense just lacked. It always did for some reason. And part of it might've been the park, but I don't really, necessarily think so i know the nl west isn't the greatest hitting league but it, it just never came together you know it's funny you say that about balsley too because he was one of those guys if you ever walked up to him and said yeah you know petco is a pitcher's park he would go nuts he would be like no no i've got charts i've got this to show you the da, 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 da. i'm like okay sorry i mentioned it you know one of those kind of one of kind of uh, conversations but yeah the ultimate compliment to him is what you just said there were guys that i had never heard of before that were Pitching big innings. Clay Meredith uh, was one of those guys, the, the sidewinding you know, right-hander. They had uh, Kevin Cameron, who came out of nowhere with the Minnesota organization. Justin Hampson was another guy. Uh, who had ever heard of Mike Adams at that point? Or, or Heath Bell, to say yep. the least. Scott Linebrink. I mean, there were just guys down the line that you're like, where did these guys come from and how are they fitting in so well? One guy after another. And, and, and you know, Balls was as good as it gets as making – you know, taking the time to to dissect each individual guy and be a coach for all 12 guys on his staff or how many other guys they had at the time. But man, he was yeah, he's the best. I'm I'm bummed to see he's not back in it yet. I know he's he's talked about getting back in it in some capacity. I, I keep up with him quite a bit. Um, but, you know, those guys are those guys are hard to find. And I know it's a younger generation and it's a analytical generation but balls was doing analytics before it was you know talked about really yeah i mean his scouting reports and his game planning was second to none he had umpire charts too didn't he he had everything he yeah. he had everything you can imagine and when when you have a guy like greg maddox show up there and compliment him on how great of a pitching coach he is um after all the years greg's pitched it, that says it all right there yeah, you were you were on some characters uh, in pitching coach uh, in in that role. I mean, Larry Rothschild was one of the guys that uh, we I knew pretty well with with the Cubs, and he had a different little personality than Balls did. And you, know, you said you had uh, Mike Maddox as well. I mean, you you learn different things from each of those guys, I would imagine. Oh yeah, everybody's different. You know, I had great pitching coaches, great managers, um, and and you look back sometimes too, and and realize that maybe some of the stuff that they were trying to help you with you, you look back later on down the road and go, man, I should have, you know, something on that should have clicked earlier than it did or, or, or whatever. But I was really lucky. And, you know, that's my personality. I always like to, to dissect other people's personalities and understand how we're going to click the best. And, and I think good players do that. And I think really good coaches do that. And that's, that's why I've always enjoyed coaching too, is you have to wear a bunch of different hats for, every different player because everyone comes from different places and has different attitudes and different confidence levels and everything that goes along with it. So good coaches can bring the best out in those guys. All right. So enough about your pitching, because I know you're proud of your, your hitting as well. And I was around you in 04 when you, you hit two home runs in the same season 
And it was a uh, cause for celebration because uh, you don't see that all that often, unless your name is Carlos Zambrano or Fergie Jenkins or Mike Hampton, who you worked with as well in New York. Yeah. But, uh, you know, the feeling that to hit a home run as a pitcher, that, that's got to be cloud nine stuff. Man, hitting the, the the ones at Wrigley were unbelievable. This one right here, that was my first career homer off Rick Helling. That was a special night because that was my first start as a brewer. And I'd gotten traded there that off season, and that was the home opener. So we had opened up with three on the road, and I was pitching game four and coming off, right? We're playing the the previous year's World Series champs, and it was a big night. So packed house, and I got into a hanging curveball and hit it out. So, man, yeah, I was on cloud nine there. The ones I the ones I hit at Wrigley, um, I don't. I, yeah, you feel like you're gliding. You are on. A, you are on a cloud. I mean, there's nothing like hitting a home run in the big leagues. I talk about it probably ten times more than I do my pitching. I love it. And uh, I actually hit. I hit two more homers that year. So technically, hit four in that season because I hit two in Iowa before I came up and joined the guys. I hit two in one game. So that was my best home run output ever. Uh, two thousand four for sure. And, you know, you picked on some, you know, obviously, uh, Hellings was a great pitcher in his, in his own right. Uh, you also hit one off of a, a former Cy Young Award winner. Yes. For the Cardinals. Yes. And that would be Chris Carpenter. And then you hit one against the Reds later on that year. It was toward the end of uh, September of 04 against Luke Hudson of the Reds. Yes. I remember after, so I hit the one off Carpenter and then, I don't think it was the same series. It might have been a different Cardinals series. Dusty put me into pinch hit early in a game uh, so he didn't burn a position player. And I pinch hit off Matt Morris. And Matt, I, you know, I battled him or whatever, and I think he might have thrown me a curveball. And I hit it good out to left center, pretty deep. And it was caught. And that night I ran into Carp and and Morris at, at one of the restaurants in Chicago. They were out eating, and he was like, "Dude, what it like? What is going on?" <laughs> it was pretty. It was funny. It was good, you know, banter back and forth. And those guys are great pitchers, so it was fun to get to face them. So now, if you're pitching uh, in the big leagues today, you don't get to hit because the DH has come to both leagues. Now, I, I'm a purist. I'm one of those guys that grew up in a National League town, uh, and at least on the north side of town with uh, with the Cubs here, and watching pitchers hit and watching managers come out and make the double switch, which belongs in the Hall of Fame. I think the double switch is just have a statue of, of a guy that, you know, is doing yeah. the double switch motion there. Yeah. But, I mean, now it's like, okay, well, you got nine hitters, and, uh, okay, the pitcher can stay in. He's getting shelled, but who cares? He can he can eat up innings. It just, it, I, I don't know. I still don't like it, but I get it. Well, we're, uh, what are we, like 12 games into the season? I missed it already. Yeah. I do. I, mean, I, I know everyone gets mad and talks about how they hate watching pitchers hit and bunt and everything else, but that's not really the whole story. The whole story is what you're talking about. The strategy. The strategy, the double switching, the understanding where your pitcher's at in the order and do I have to burn a reliever and, you know, all that fun stuff. Do I have to burn a bench guy early in the game? There's a lot that goes along with it, and it's it's all out the window. But it's, I don't. It's not going to change. Um, I think we're we're past it now. It's going to be. I, I did hear some rumblings though that they they were thinking about having some kind of shift where if the starting pitcher comes out of the game, then it change or it doesn't go five innings or something. I was hearing some stuff that they were going to try and mess around with rules or toy around with, but I doubt it'll happen. I think it's, I think we're DH for the rest of our lives. Yeah, I agree with you. Now you weren't one of these guys that would have been affected by the next thing they're talking about the pitch clock because you work quickly. I mean, I, I know that we used to love the, especially when you started on a getaway day because you knew you were going to get to the plane and get to the next city on time because you know, you weren't messing around. There's a lot of guys now that, you know, it seems like they're not either. They're not sure of their stuff. They don't have a good conversation or good uh, communication with the catcher they're not on the same page. It takes forever for these guys to throw a ball. I mean, I think the pitch clock actually might might help. Yeah, we might have some. Uh, I would say some of it could be the uh, paralysis by analysis too, right? There's a lot going on, a lot of information. Um, from what I've seen so far, I like the pitch calm. It seems to be working yeah. cool. The only thing, the only question I had was, okay, if you shake, then he's got to go back and punch in again. Or do you then shift the signs? I've, I've kind of been watching it a little bit, but um, I, I feel like that's good. I think I would have used it because um, I work so quick anyways. It, I would have just been like, all right, I kind of know what I'm going to throw. And, and you know, they're going to fire it out and we're on the same page. So 
that seems to be all right. Pitch clock, I think, is great. Bring it in. I mean, those, especially the relievers, man, they take ten Forever. seconds just coming set now. What I don't, I don't. That's one I don't get at all. That we've gotten into this coming set, tapping three times, and this whole. I don't get it. James Shields was great at it because he was doing it to to hold the guy at first base. That was a different story. Now we got guys doing it with nobody on base, and and it's somewhat ridiculous. But um, I hope I hope we continue to evolve into just things that work well for the game. I'm not opposed to bringing anything in, but um, let's let's not be crazy about it. Yeah, now, I know you were a, you were a pitching coach for a little while down there. I believe Lake Elsinore, correct? Yeah, Lake Elsinore, California League. What uh, what was that experience like? I mean, sometimes guys that have excelled and had long major league careers have a hard time dealing with some of these younger guys that have different perspectives, let's say, on uh, on what the game is all about and what they're all about. How did that go for you? It was really cool. Uh, I loved it. Uh, the guys were awesome. And, and now it's cool to see so many of the guys that I had that came through. And I was there 2015 through 17, so three years. Um but to see all, all these guys come through uh, and then a lot of them made it to the big leagues with the Padres and then a lot of them are elsewhere now and, and, and in the big leagues, position players and pitchers, fun to be around them, fun to help them on the mental side. It's such a difficult journey that they go on in the minor leagues because they're just kind of flailing in the wind and they don't know where they're going to be next and how long they're going to be there and and how hard it is to really get to the big leagues and how to perform at the big league level. So it's, it's cool. I think to help them along that journey. That's a great facility out there. And then Lake Elsinore too, the diamond. Oh, it was fun. We had a blast. Yeah. That great crew. And, uh, um, just a, a really good time. My boys got to be in the clubhouse when they were a little bit younger and hang out. And so they got to learn the ropes and I, I would love to do it again at some point. I think if the, if my, when my boys get a little bit older, I would love to get back in the game as a coach in some capacity, but we'll see. Yeah, I was going to ask you that because uh, you know now you're you're, uh, you're too busy being the clubby at first base. Yeah, I'm a first base clubby now. Yeah, so <laughs> collecting Evo shields. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. All right, before I let you go, I'm a big numbers guy, uh, jersey number guy. That is, and I want to see if you remember all your jersey numbers from back when you were in Kansas City all the way through to the Rockies. So let's start with Kansas City. I'll nail it. Ready? Okay, good. Fifty three. Okay, excellent. Correct. What about the Mets? 48. Okay. What about the Brewers? Uh, 39. Correct. Cubs. Hard six, 33. Hard six. Hard six the hard way. Padres. Padres was 38. And then you finished it up with the Rockies and? Finished it up with the uh, old Magic Johnson, 32, and Latroy yeah. Hawkins. I asked, when, when I got there, I said, hey, Hawk, I know you wore 32 in Colorado. Have they retired it yet, or can I wear it? <laughs> <laughs> Was there any other rhyme or reason for any of those jerseys, or were you just giving them? Um, no, I was given all those jerseys. I never asked for a number in my career, and I never had the same number twice. Uh, in Kansas City, I felt like they gave me 53 in spring training, and I made the team my first camp. So I was like, it, right? I'm not going to ask for anything. I yeah. did, though. I did have – in Chicago, I thought about switching to 18 when Moises left because 18 was my favorite number growing up. And I had it all the way through high school and all the way through the minor leagues. I wore it all the way to AAA. But when I got to Kansas City, Johnny Damon, of course, had 18. But I grew up uh, loving Daryl Strawberry. And number 18 was he was my guy and loved 18. But I thought about it more and more. I'm like, I can't wear 18. Mo, there's nobody like Mo. There's, you know, nobody's going to replace. Moises is number 18, so I just I stayed away. Yeah, there's a lot of pressure with numbers. I mean, yeah. look at look at the Cubs. I mean, with uh, when John Lester comes in and he wants to wear 34, you know, it wasn't retired. It's not retired for Woody, but you know, that, that's a hard act to follow. Yeah, no doubt. No, it is hard. You know, I always uh, you know, uh Jeremy Burnitz and I are are really close and and hang out quite a bit. And I'm always fascinated. I tell I always tell people this story on the golf course that he came in and replaced Sammy Sosa in right field in Chicago. And, and there was really wasn't a peep about it because he played so well. He was a great defender, swung the bat well that year. And you didn't really hear anything like, Oh, Hey, 
you know, the guy that we brought in to replace Sammy after all these years is terrible or he's brutal or we don't like his contract or whatever. So it's pretty impressive feat. And he's such a quiet, humble guy about baseball. He doesn't really talk about it. So I always tell the story for him. Yeah, it's the truth. I mean, because that that could have been pretty ugly. I mean, we, you talk about the end of that 04 season with with Sammy leaving after the first inning and, you know, videotape surfacing and uh, the trade. Yeah, that was nuts. And it's still nuts because they haven't welcomed him back. Yeah, and then the next year we brought Jock in, you know, Jock Jones, and one of the right. greatest teammates you could ever have, too. And but like the first week, man, they were like they were already angry at Jock, you know, because he hadn't hadn't uh, performed the way he wanted him to in the first seven days. And then I remember he hit a he hit an oppo bomb at Wrigley that was like kind of got it going, and then and then everybody was cool. You know, it's so funny you say that too because I got to know Jock pretty well too when uh, went with the Cubs, and then followed him throughout i mean i would i would hook up with him whenever we were uh, at the padres were playing one of his teams as well and it's just so weird from from my perspective and from your perspective because you're a teammate of him i'm a guy covering him every day knowing what a kind of a guy he is and then hearing the treatment that he gets because like you say seven days without you know doing something i mean seven days in the grand scheme of 162 games are you kidding me yeah, well, you know how that works. People oh, are, already, uh, yeah, people are already buying playoff tickets now for teams twelve games, in, twelve games into the season. So, um, and uh, who's let's see who's getting abused? Garrett Cole's getting abused because he yeah. had a rough start or whatever. It's like, hey, man, when you look up at the end of his thirty-three starts, he's probably going to be pretty good this year. Yeah, the numbers tend to not lie when it comes to track record. You know, I mean, it, 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 you may have a hard time getting there at times, but you, you know, maybe you start well and you don't finish. I mean. What do you want? I mean, you 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 can't keep up that excellence the entire. It's very rare if you can't. Yeah, no, that's what my my pitching coach uh, had in the minor leagues coming up uh, with Kansas City. Tom Bergmeyer. He always said it the best. He said, "Hey, turn the back of that baseball card over. It's going to be somewhere around where it's supposed to be. As long as the guy's healthy, and you know, right. guys have bad years, guys have off years, but for the most part, those studs that you count on to be a you know a, a quality major leaguer throughout multiple seasons that have done it for a lot of years, they're their numbers are going to be somewhere around where they should be. Yeah, it always uh, always seems to end up that way. But yeah, as you say, fans are fans for a reason. And, uh, hey, they're passionate about their clubs. And you don't want to ever say, hey, don't be passionate about your club. Yeah, no, that's right. Everyone has a right as a fan to, to root and, and boo and do everything they want and, and get upset five games into the season or get upset 155 games into the season. <laughs> Seems like they used to get upset 155 games a season on the north side. Yeah. Yeah. I hate to admit I was one of those people for a long, long time before I started working. Yeah, no, it's it's hard. It's hard to uh you know, I'm I'm glad now I'm I'm pulled back uh far enough that I just I just I really watch all the teams and um I think last night I probably watched like six different games and you know, an inning spurt here and there and see who's playing where and all those Lake E guys are all over the place, man. We got some in Milwaukee, Ty Francis in Seattle, uh, Fran Mel Reyes and Cal Quantrill and Josh Naylor. Those guys are in uh, in Cleveland. So I, I kind of flip around and see how those guys are doing too, which is cool. Yeah, you got to take care of your guys, the ones that you, uh, you had an influence on. Yeah. Well, Glennon, it's been great to catch up with you. It's been far too long, and I'm glad you uh, agreed to come on here today because, like I said, you were one of my favorite guys to, to cover and just – the conversations in the clubhouse had nothing to do with baseball after a while. And that's the, that's the best part of the whole thing of getting to know guys like you. Yeah, we had a lot of fun and yeah, you generally, uh, my conversations will shift to music or concerts or any of that kind of fun stuff. So yeah, it was, it was always fun. Pleasure to be around you and you know, Hey, we were lucky enough to do it in two different places. I know. How about that? And Maddox, the same thing. Maddox, I'll never forget the first time I saw Maddox in 07 in spring training. He looked at me, he goes, Oh, you're working here too. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> that's, i'm like really thanks thanks yeah. good to be uh good to be welcomed by the uh the, the hall of famer and the always cy young award winner yeah the, the guy that uh got away with more things off the field than and i don't mean by get away with doing bad things but yeah the jokester that he is and was and still probably is nothing's changed i got i have to tell you one more story real quick yeah, I yeah. this is kind of a false ending here but i was doing the basketball games for the university of san diego and one year we opened up at UNLV. So my table was toward the USD bench. And, you know, there's a bunch of seats that were right behind me. So I'm getting my stuff prepped. I'm getting ready to do the uh, the pregame show. And I feel 
like popcorn being thrown at the back of my head. I'm like, what the hell is going on here? And I'm just like brushing it off. And I wasn't going to, I wasn't going to give whoever it was a satisfaction of turning around and, you know, getting upset about it. It continued. I'm like, what the hell? And I look, turned around and there's Maddox with Chase <laughs> just smiling at me going, hi. That's so great. I forgot yeah, to get season awesome. tickets. Yeah. Yeah. I wish we got, I, w- I wish I got to see him more. We, we usually try and get together if I go through Vegas or wherever, but um, man, he's so funny. Yeah. He, what a, what a blast. Yeah, he was fun to be around as well. And you were fun to be around, and I really do appreciate it. Uh, hey, continue success at your uh, clubhouse position over there at first base. <laughs> do it well. Wave him around. I hope you're waving around a lot of guys, including your son. I appreciate it. Thanks, Maze.